All right, well, it's, it's 12.02, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Steve Bird, the Clinician Experience Officer, and I'd like to welcome you to our CXO Wellness Grand Rounds. The, these Grand Rounds were started in 2020 to allow experts in various aspects of well-being to share their research and insights to all of you. And we are delighted to welcome one such expert this afternoon, Bridget Schulte. Bridget Schulte is the director of the Better Life Lab and the Good Life Initiative at New America, a nonpartisan think tank and author of the New York Times bestselling book, Overwhelmed, Work, Love, and Play When No One Has the Time. I suspect that resonates with you. She has spoken widely about how to make time for a better life by redesigning work cultures to focus on effective work by reimagining gender roles for a fair division of labor and opportunity at work and at home, and by rewiring social policy to meet the needs of a diverse 21st century families. And instead of seeking status in busyness, by recapturing the value of leisure. She was formerly a journalist at the Washington Post and Washington Post Magazine, where she was part of a team that won the 2008 Pulitzer Prize. Uh, she lives in Alexandria, Virginia with her husband, Tom Bowman, who covers the military for NPR and their two children. She grew up in Portland, Oregon, and spent her summers in Wyoming on her family's sheep ranch, where she did not feel so overwhelmed. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Tiffany Morsimus, who's chair of OBGYN, who recommended having Bridget join us today. And lastly, the plan is for a roughly 40-minute presentation, followed by a 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A and I will be monitoring the chat for that Q&A. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask of our guests, simply type, type it in the chat feature and I'll address it. And now, without further ado, please welcome Bridget Schulte. Well, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here today and I'm really looking forward not only to share my research and reporting and what I've learned, but also to really have a conversation with you and answer your, and your, of your questions and, and really get into a great dialogue. So let me start by sharing my screen. Let me see if I've, uh, let's see, can you, uh, your screen sharing? Okay, good. I'm still trying to figure out all of this uh, pandemic uh, technology. So what I'd really like to do, you know, this is about, uh, this, this conversation is about well-being. Um, and what I'd really like to do is, is help us all rethink or reframe the narrative. You know, when we think about, you know, particularly medicine and, you know, these professional cultures, we tend to think that well-being is sort of a nice to have, uh, you know, that it's sort of, a, it's an addition or it's a luxury, that the work and, you know, just kind of working all the time, that that's really what's important. And what I hope at the end of this conversation, you'll really begin to see how well-being is integral to actually doing good work and having that uh, you know, uh, well-being at work and at home is really critical and how it's different for, for uh, men and women and across the gender spectrum and that there, how there are, there are sort of justice issues around gender, around race, around uh, inequality that's all baked into this, this question uh, about well-being and really understanding how well-being is the foundation for excellence culture. So that's that is my mission today to try to convince you that the Iron Man culture of medicine is, uh, uh, needs to be a thing of the past. So here, let's dive right in. Let's see if I can get this working. All right, so let's first start with the vision. Um, I always like to kind of start with the end in mind. And so really, what is the end? When we talk about you know, work-life balance, work-life integration, or the good life, what are we really talking about? Where is it that we really hope to go? Uh, or in some people's minds thinks it's impossible to go. And I'm going to show that it's difficult, but not impossible. So what's the vision? You know, the, the Harvard psychologist, Eric Erickson, he said that the richest and fullest lives make time for the three great arenas of life, work, love, and play. Uh, and I'm going to argue here today how we need time in each, each of those three great arenas of life to have that sense of, of the good life. So let's start with, so that's the vision. Let's start with the current reality. Well, where are we right now? Uh, and I would say that even before the pandemic, we were in this state of time famine, um, experiencing what I termed time confetti in my book, just this feeling of 
everything all at once, all the time, you know, breaking, you know, breaking kind of time and life into little bits. Um, what many of us experience is work-life conflict. When, the, when your responsibilities and duties at work really conflict or spill over into, into your life. Um, you know, this is something that for the longest time was considered uh, something that only women experienced, you know, because they had uh, sort of the home, home life duties. But the surveys and studies really show that it is ubiquitous. It is not just for women only. Men too spirit experience work-life conflict or work-family conflict. Um, people who have uh, caring responsibilities certainly experience it in, at a very uh, heavy level. But so do others, so do singles, so do people in, in a number of different um, sort of family organizations. That so much of this is really driven by our work cultures, which have become increasingly intensive and increasingly what, uh, uh, what researchers call greedy, that work has become a greedy institution. So, so work is, is sort of sucking time away from our life, time away from play, sort of those two other great arenas. But then the other issue, the other thing that's happening is that work itself is becoming more complicated. There was a fascinating study done not long ago uh, out of Stanford looking at work, work conflict. And it was a study that was initially done trying to understand work-life conflict among academic uh, people who, in academic medicine. And what they found instead is that there certainly was work-life conflict, but on top of that, there was this additional complication where there was a mismatch between, uh, there were so many different things that somebody was supposed to do at work, and there was a mismatch between what somebody really wanted to do or felt was meaningful, and then the time that they really had to spend on it. Uh, some of this was driven by work culture expectations, um, uh, ambiguity about what was expected, uh, and, and things not really lining up. Like for instance, um, uh, you know, people were paid by the number of uh, patients that they saw, but their promotions were based on the research that they did. Uh, and for women, oftentimes this shows up in sort of uh, the, the expectation that women will do kind of the quote unquote office housework, or particularly again in this study with academic medicine, that women are more expected to do the mentoring and the service work that isn't often rewarded. Uh, so there is this feeling that work itself has become complicated. And, you know, one doctor I, I, I interviewed from a podcast said, he said, I feel like I need to be an octopus. I have eight different arms going in all sorts of different directions and I can't seem to get anything done. Uh, and so it, it contributes to this feeling of exhaustion and burnout. Um, you know, long before the pandemic showed that work really doesn't work, uh, there was a uh, increasing evidence that the way we work just simply isn't working for anyone. And we have an increasingly bifurcated labor force. We've got the professional class, if you will, where we've got long work hours and uh, heavy work expectations. And then on the other hand, there's uh, hourly work where you can't get enough hours. And so you're cobbling together several different kinds of jobs. There's precarity in both, uh, you know, sort of both ends of the, uh, of the socioeconomic spectrum. Um, we've got toxic work cultures where people feel that they don't have autonomy or they don't have uh, a, a voice or a say. Uh, there was a study done by Jeff Pfeffer, who's a, a management professor, uh, along with his colleagues, Joe Go and Stefan Zenios uh, at Harvard and at Stanford. And what they did is they took a meta-analysis of more than 200 studies looking at work stress and how that related to chronic ill health or chronic uh, diseases. And what they found is that simply the stress from, from just the way we work, they looked at what are, what are considered psychosocial stressors at work, like long work hours, like work-life conflict, uh, like not having uh, sort, of, um, uh, sort of low job control, uh, you know, sexual harassment, um, no access to health insurance, and these 10 psychosocial stressors. And they found that the way that we work now, again, before the pandemic sort of ratcheted everything up to 11, um, is the fifth leading cause of death in the United States with very intensive, um, between five and 8% of, uh, of our health costs. So this is even before the pandemic, the way that we're working across the board wasn't working for anybody. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about, so, so that's the current reality. So what's driving this overwhelm? Where, where does it come from? 
You know, is it a new phenomenon? You know, and I would say that, uh, you know, in reporting my book, uh, in looking at work and love and play as sort of the three great arenas of life, really understanding that there are three very, very powerful myths that drive overwhelm in each one of these three arenas. So I want to briefly go through these uh, and then move forward to what we do about it. And, you know, what can we do? Uh, the individual, the organizational, and then at the larger societal level. So the first myth uh, is one that I certainly bought into, and that's the myth number one, that the best workers work all the time, that you are always and everywhere available to work. So researchers call this the ideal worker. You know, and I don't know if you remember, this was a Cadillac commercial of a couple of years ago, and this guy was talking about, you know, Americans are amazing. We, we work all the time and, uh, you know, these silly Europeans and they drink coffee at the end of the day and they have summers off, but, you know, we're better because we work so hard, uh, you know, and to that point, he's, he's ignoring all of the, you know, that I'll get into all of the research that shows that, that innovation and creativity and some of the greatest, you know, ideas have come from not being at work, but in leisure time away from work. Um, the great philosopher uh, Joseph Pieper talked about leisure as the basis of culture, that it is when we are away from the, the getting and the doing and the striving, that that's when art, philosophy, and sort of the great ideas actually uh, are able to be born into the world, if you will. So, but this notion of the always on, always available ideal worker is very powerful uh, in the United States. And you see it even now, um, you know, before the pandemic, there was sort of the 24-hour always-on culture. And, uh, you know, you saw that in the pandemic, maybe you couldn't be in the office 24 hours, but you were getting 24-hour emails or surveillance from bosses. Uh, and in the post-pandemic world, you can see it where, where now, as we're trying to figure out, do we come back to work and, and do we go back to the office? Uh, you have people saying, well, I can tell who the, who the great workers are going to be because they're going to be in the office. They're not going to want to work remote and flexibly. And that is just simply not true. That is, a, that is so much based on the ideal worker mythology. We can get into that later. So when it comes to medicine, you know, uh, as I've done reporting and I've talked with doctors and, and nurses and, and people in the healthcare profession, one of the things that they say is that there's a very strong Iron Man culture. Uh, you have to always be available, you know, that you can't show any sign of weakness, you never take vacation, you are always on, you know, you may be exhausted, but you just power through it, you push on. And, you know, when you look at, at uh, statistics like from burnout, you know, uh, where one in two physicians before the pandemic were exhibiting at least one symptom of burnout, where nurse burnout is really intense. Uh, and then you look at through the pandemic where so many, this is, this is where, um, you know, burnout just went out of control and, you know, stories of physician suicide have come out. Uh, you know, when you have that Ironman culture and you, you are coming up against burnout where you are feeling exhausted, where you're feeling cynical, where you're feeling like not only are you not effective at your work, but that it doesn't matter. You're kind of like losing that sense of meaning and efficacy. Um, that that really is an epidemic. It was before the pandemic. It certainly is now. And people talk about this is an issue we need to deal with. Nobody seems quite sure how to do it. Frankly, if you look at a lot of the advice that's out, that's out there, it can sort of be summed up by go take a bath, you know, as, as if it's an individual problem that you just need to kind of relax a little bit more. And it's really not the case at all. What the burnout research shows that it's very much systematic. And it's very much about the environment that you are operating in. And so it is incumbent upon managers and leaders and systems to figure out how they need to change. It's a much bigger issue. Um, uh, and it's sort of one of the final points I want to make about the, you know, the myth of the ideal worker. You know, if we have this notion that the more you work, the longer work, you, the longer hours you work, the better you are, or, you know, the more productive you are, all you have to do is look at this graph and show that, that it's not the case at all. That, that what this is, this is an, uh, a, co a comparison of you know, pr productivity per hour's work by country. And you can see this very one-to-one -one relationship that as work hours increase, productivity goes down. And the United States is one of the, you know, one of the top offenders, if you will. We work among the longest hours and the most irregular hours of any advanced economy. And then when you look at measures of productivity per hour's work, 
how many of those hours are actually good hours. You know, we're kind of in the middle of the pack, uh, right along with Denmark and France that everybody loves to make fun of uh, for their short work hours and their long vacations. And the most productive company per hour's work is actually Norway. So keep that in mind when, you know, when your boss wants you to stay late or you're getting those late night emails, that that's actually not the most effective way to be uh, doing the most effective work. The second myth I want to talk about in sort of the, the love, the, uh, the great arena of love is this notion that mothers know best. Uh, that somehow women are just uh, naturally suited to being the caregivers and that that's not only where they belong, but that's what they're better at. These myths are very powerful and they affect, they affect all of us, you know, whether you are actually a mother or not. Uh, you know, if you make a choice not to be a mother, you can actually be judged for that. The, the research shows that that is the expectation of sort of being the quote unquote good woman. Yeah, and the idea is that the, just as the ideal worker is always and everywhere available to work, the ideal mother is supposed to be always and everywhere available to be a mother, a caregiver, taking care of the home. Um, you know, this ignores the reality that the majority of mothers work, uh, even mothers of infants and young children. This is a, a, obviously before the pandemic when, you know, now we've lost uh, at least two million women, largely because of care responsibilities. Um, but most of the children, the majority of children in the United States are being raised in families where all available parents work, either in dual income families or in single parent families. Um, and yet, even though uh, really since the 1970s, uh, you know, when women entered the workforce in mass, that's changed. But what didn't change was anything else. Uh, women are still expected to give, uh, to be the primary caregiver. They're still expected to do all of that mental labor organizing, planning, uh, make, taking other people's emotional temperatures. And that takes an awful lot of time. Um, and, and this shows up in, um, you know, the gaps in time that women can spend at work, in pay gaps, in opportunity gaps, and really in unconscious bias, uh, you know, this, this expectation. And women have it as well as men, this sort of automatic assumption that men are the breadwinners and women are or should be the caregivers. And if you look at surveys like the General Social Survey, it's clear that we've become, a, as a nation, uh, sort of tolerant, if you will, of women working. It's fine if women work, we think that they can and should, but there's also a, a very strong plurality that think it's okay to work as long as women also do all of the care work, which is really why I wrote the title, the title of my book was Overwhelmed, because that's simply impossible to do. You know, in the professional sense, this is what this is one of my favorite charts, and I, I think it's really important, particularly for professionals, to understand this: that those sort of um, uh, ideal worker, ideal mother norms really end up shaping your your day, your career, uh, you know, the expectations around you. So this is some time use of uh, of associate professors. What I want you to look at is the blue and the purple. That's homework and care work. And you, if you look, these are women and men doing the same jobs at the same level. And if you look, women are doing about twice to housework and childcare and care work. And then the other area I want you to look at is the red area. And that's research, sort of that concentrated work time. Uh, that's where you, you know, deep work. That's where you get your, your, um, you know, your most important meaningful work done in this kind of, uh, in this kind of organization, you know, as, as a professor. And you look and you see that men have far more time than women do, that women's time here, like women's time, what, what time these research will show you know, in any field, women's time is much more interrupted, um, it comes in shorter chunks, and so it's simply more difficult to get that, that concentrated time in. And this, in the, in this uh, you know, as, as in the sort of the, uh, the academic sphere, that's where you get rewarded. You, you, you know, your research is how you uh, earn your promotions and you get invited to conferences and you develop your reputation. So because of these, you know, these, these very powerful myths, this is actually shaping people's uh, careers and their lives and experiences. Uh, you know, we often talk about the pay gap and I think what's really important to understand is the pay gap between men and women is really a care gap. Um, you know, in studies that they've, they've found that, you know, for unmarried or people without children or caregiving responsibilities, you know, there tends to be a, a much narrower gap. 
but it really is intense for uh, mothers versus fathers. That when a, a child comes onto the scene or a family decides to begin, uh, you know, a couple decides to, to start a family, the expectation because of these cultural myths is that the man will work harder and because he's got to be a provider and a breadwinner, so we will reward him. So he actually gets what's called a fatherhood bonus. Whereas women are then going to be expected to be the main caregivers and will the expectation is they won't be as committed or dedicated to work. So they actually get uh, you know, the, the maternal wall, they hit the maternal wall, even though the actual data doesn't bear this out at all. Working mothers, as I can certainly attest, work incredibly hard. Um, you know, and there's all sorts of objective data that shows that, that uh, you know, this kind of pay gap, this hit that you take is really unfair and based on these unconscious biases. Uh, you know, this sort of leads into the next area that I want to talk about in the great, the three great arenas of, of work, love, and play. This also, it, because of these breadwinner, kind of homemaker uh, sort of uh, icons, you know, ideals that we have, we also don't expect women to have leisure time. Um, when you look at the history of leisure, um, Thorsten Veblen in the classic theory of the leisure class writes, he dismisses women on page two. And he said that leisure has always been the province of high class men. You know, the further you got away from work, the more you showed your status. And the more leisure you had, the more status you, you could show. And that women were always, always supposed to do the drudge work. So he said, you know, the, all the drudge work of society was done by the servants, the slaves, and also all the women. So throughout history, women have never had a history or culture of leisure time. You know, and when you think about it in popular culture, it's it's sort of denigrated as you're selfish and you want sort of silly me time. Uh, and the really fascinating feminist leisure research that shows men have no, no worries about taking leisure. I mean, there, there's, there is this sense that, uh, you know, going golfing or out with friends, there is a sense of, of deservingness. Uh, but women do not have that same sense of, I deserve this. Women tend to feel that they need to earn it. Uh, there was a fascinating study done all around the world, and they found that, that women felt like if they had a moment of free time, that what they needed to do was to get to the end of their to-do list, and then maybe they could take time off for themselves. And if any of you who have a to-do to -do list, as you know, that to-do list never ends. Uh, so the, that leads into the last sort of myth, if you will, and that, that, that is that leisure is a waste of time. That here in the United States, we're productive. We always want to be on. We always want to be making and doing. And, and you know, even our leisure should be productive. And if you have a hobby, maybe you should own an Etsy store. Um, that there is this, this sense that, that leisure is a waste of time. Instead, what we've tended to value here is busyness. Um, I, in my book, I went to, to actually spend some time with somebody who studies busyness as sort of a badge of honor. Uh, and she does that by studying holiday letters and Christmas cards and people send them to her. And we went through an entire archive and back in the 60s, there wasn't the same compunction of busyness and, the, and the, the letters were lovely and genuine. And they became more and more like brag sheets over the years, you know, like look how much we can do and look at how much we can cram into a day. We are valuable. And what her view is, we've made busyness so important that it's almost become uh, not only a badge of honor, but a price of admission. And that even if we aren't busy, we will create it to feel valuable. So keep that in mind, because what behavioral science has found is that when we're in that kind of busy, always on breathless state, what ends up happening is actually what they call tunneling. Our vision actually narrows. There was some interesting research they did. They found that when you're in that sense of time scarcity, your IQ actually drops 13 points. What, you know, think about it, when you're in the tunnel, you can only focus on what you can see right ahead of you. Now, if you're in surgery, or if you're doing a, a specific task, that tunneling is actually a really good thing. But for the rest of your life, when you're in that tunnel, you can't see like, what's creating some of the other problems. You can't look beyond that horizon and make different decisions that might keep you out of the tunnel in the first place. So we kind of continue on and on in the tunnel. And then the terrible thing is we can't see clearly, but our, our culture rewards us for that. So it's, it's kind of this crazy uh, reinforcing cycle that then actually leads to burnout. And what's important here is when, we, when we're looking at the science of 
insight and where creativity comes from, what we're learning is that it actually comes from when our brains are in not the focused, concentrated mode, but in the diffuse mode, kind of that daydreamy mode. And one of my favorite stories to, to make that point is there was a researcher from Amnesty International. She was stuck on a train between Manchester and London for four hours. And so what did she do? She just looked out the window. She kind of spaced out and daydreamed. And at the end of that four hours, the author J.K. Rowling has said the entire plot of the Harry Potter series fell into her brain. So can you imagine what we, had lost, what we would have lost if she was busy answering all of her emails, which is probably something I would have done. So, so now we've kind of got the kind of what drives overwhelm. And now we've got this brave new world. We've got Corona that, that we've all been living in this pandemic. And so what's happened? The second shift has gotten even longer for women. You know, they've been mainly responsible for the care and the homeschooling. And we've got healthcare workers who are even more stressed, where they're thinking about, um, you know, it's just too much and the three in 10 are considering even leaving the profession. You know, and what historians will say is that crises like, the, like these, they reveal what is already broken or in the process of breaking. All right, so what do we do? So let's, let's talk about how we need to reframe the narrative, how we need to move beyond the ideal worker and move beyond these myths of ideal mother and that leisure is a waste of time. And we need to be thinking about work-life excellence. And it's not, you know, you talk about uh, executives who think that work-life balance is a, is a myth or impossibility. Let's talk about work-life excellence and well-being as the key to what we really need to be productive, to do meaningful work, to have time for our lives and to create that space for leisure. Um, the research is clear that healthy workers do better work, uh, that better sleep, um, better decisions. Um, happy workers are actually more productive. Creative energy goes up. Uh, studies of doctors show that they make um, faster and better diagnoses when they're in this positive uh, mood. Uh, we're also learning that diverse teams are actually smarter. There's fascinating research out of MIT that shows that when you have teams with more women on them, the collective intelligence rises. Uh, when you have teams that are diverse across race and class and gender, the decisions are more reflective of, of the, the, the population as a whole, that you actually get to better decisions when there is diversity. And there's enough diversity that people feel that they can speak and be heard, that you're not sort of tokenized as sort of a one-off. So let's talk about designing interventions. Because what you, what you really need to think about is that it, just as burnout is not an individual problem that requires an individual solution, work-life excellence is also not an individual problem that requires an individual solution. There are things that you can do that I'm going to tell you about in a little bit, but I want to talk about why it's important as leaders and as managers, you need to be aware of what you can do. And the first thing, I think we mix up wellness and well-being. Uh, you know, wellness is all about lunchtime yoga or offering smoking cessation or meditation. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that is simply not enough. And what the research will show is that if you offer lunchtime yoga, but you're sending emails at all hours and you're expecting long uh, burnout work culture, that what you've done is you've actually created more cynicism, um, more mistrust. So if, you know, think about uh, what, not so much lunchtime yoga, but you need to think about what's called work hygiene. How do you change work itself so that it is meaningful and fair and does not require burnout cultures? You know, that's what you need to focus on. And then if lunchtime yoga fits in that, that's fine, but don't just give us lunchtime yoga. Recognize that the most precious resources for your human resources are time and attention. So if you send that late night email, maybe you're getting, you're, you're sort of getting that off of your mind. But now what you've done is you've just loaded the cognitive load of everybody else that you've sent that email to. So we need to be thinking about the systems that really, uh, you know, that address not only, uh, you know, your own uh, bandwidth, but everybody else around you. And understand that change can come from a lot of different ways, but leaders and organizations really do drive change. This is Michelle Fornoy. She was one of the top leaders in the Obama administration at the Pentagon. And she came in uh, and she said, you know, I've got three kids and uh, I'm going to need to be home for story time and dinner more often than not. And at the time, the defense secretary, Bob Gates, said, OK, you got it. And he set her up with secure systems so that she could have late night meetings at home if she needed to. Uh, she hired a driver so that she could do work as she came back and forth to work. And she felt so supported in having kind of her authentic self, her work self and her life 
supported, she turned around and said, how can I do that for my staff, for my team at the policy shop? And what the, what the policy shop needed to do was get out of the tunnel and imagine future threats and figure out, well, what, we, what, what did we need to do to plan for them? And she found that they were so tired and burned out, they were having a difficult time doing it. So they worked together, she did pulse surveys, they put together a team, they brought in outside consultants, and they came up with what they called the alternative work plan. And if you worked your 80 hours within a two week work period, you got the rest of the time off, no questions asked. And they trained managers in it, um, retrained them if they needed it, they worked it into performance evaluations, um, uh, you know, they, they worked it in so that it would live beyond her. It wouldn't just be an HR one-off or cult of personality that once she left, it disappeared, which a lot of work redesigned, that's what happens. You get sort of a visionary leader, a new program comes in, it's awesome, they leave, the program dies. So she really worked to try to make it live beyond her. And so what really ended up happening is that it was an investment in human capital. And she said that not only did people feel that they had more time for their work and their life and their health and sleep got better, the work itself got better, and that the secretary even noticed it. So that's a really great example of how uh, organizing work systems, you know, to, cre to create that sense of well-being leads to excellence. You know, think about setting new defaults. Um, you know, uh, there's a, um, a lot of discussion about how the United States is one of the only countries that doesn't have paid family leave, and, and, it's, and we don't. And 80% of, of American workers do not have access to paid maternity, paid parental leave, or paid time off at all. Uh, so it's, it's very much left to, um, there's efforts in Congress now to change that, uh, but right now it's all voluntary. And there's a law firm that saw, that, that wanted to have not only uh, paid leave for mothers, uh, but they wanted to make sure that fathers took it as well, because what they noticed is that when, you know, if only women take time off when you have a child, it just reinforces that notion that women are the primary caregivers. And they wanted to, they wanted to listen to the young men who wanted to have more time and, and to become active in the home sphere, and the women who wanted to have those caregiving responsibilities and also be considered sort of still on the promotion track and, and uh, you know, very dedicated workers, they, people who wanted to have work, love, and play. And so what they did is they created a new default that instead of having to ask for paid time off, you actually, if you, you, you know, once you had a child or you had a, a caregiving need, you got six weeks off that if you didn't want it, you had to go and ask for it instead. So they completely switched the default so that the expectation was you will take this time. And what ended up happening is within a year or two, the, the, the share of men who ended up taking uh, paid parental leave shot up and to, and to the point where there were more men taking it than women at one point. Uh, so think about resetting the defaults. Um, think about systems change. This is at, uh, at Stanford. They ran an experiment called the Time Bank, um, really looking at how do you support um, you know, the researchers and the physicians who are, who are like on the, on the verge of burnout, but how do you do that with a gender equity lens? And so what they did is they came up with this idea that every time you mentored or you did a service activity, you would get time in a time bank where then you could get, say, this is a, a doctor who ordered Blue Apron because his kids were coming um, over for dinner and he, wanted to, he didn't want to like have to go grocery shopping. That would give him time to, to spend with his family or you could get uh, help with writing a grant or putting together a proposal. And what they found is not only did the work get better, uh, the research got better, the grant approval rating went up, but that people felt more supported and connected and loyal to the institution. Um, and you know, talk about changing the ideal worker culture. This is a Menlo Innovations. I, I spent some time there. It's a, a small um, software farm. Uh, and they've completely, redo, you know, kind of like turned the idea of the ideal worker on its head. They allow babies to come in. So on the one hand, that seems really nice. But on the other hand, the reason that they allow babies in is because the United States does not invest in child care and there's not a whole lot of options for families. Uh, so this is certainly a temporary solution to begin with. But I did ask the CEO, Rich Sheridan, I said, well, how do you get work done with babies around? And he just said, babies make people nicer. So, you know, this is one, uh, you know, one solution that one company had to come up with, but sort of recognizing 
that norms are changing and that men and women and people across the gender spectrum want to be involved, want more than just work. Uh, you know, that, that the breadwinner homemaker ideal was never really the, the way, if you, you know, if you look at um, some research, that was never the way that, uh, you know, for two, two short uh, decades in the 50s and the 60s, mainly white middle-class America might have lived that way because there was a commitment to something called the family wage. But that was never the case before then. And it's never been the case since. And so we really need a culture, our workplaces, and our policies to reflect the way people really live. So then what can you do as an individual? You know, set your priorities. You know, this is my favorite to-do list. If you're really going to think about redoing your to-do list, think of it as a brain dump that you get it all out but then really focus on what's most important. This is Johnny Cash's to-do list. And again, it's my favorite. Really focuses on what's important, not smoke. Number two, kiss June. Number three, not kiss anyone else. You know, really, as you're putting your to-do list together, think about what's most important. Um, really lean into the idea that pauses and uh, working in pulses rather than always on, that that actually, uh, you know, not only gives you that kind of time and space for work and love and play, but it also makes for better work. Um, you know, we all know about the 10,000 hours study to become uh, excellent at anything. Well, that was based on a study of musicians in Berlin. And they, they found that there were sort of different levels of, uh, of sort of excellence, if you will. And so this is the way teachers sort of like, uh, not to diss teachers, they're amazing, uh, you know, but in, for music teachers, this is the way they spent their time, sort of fairly consistent. But for the virtuosos, the, uh, you know, like the best students, this is the way that they spent their time. And it looks more like peaks and valleys. What they found is that they would work in pulses of no more than 90 minutes that we, just as we have 90 minute sleep cycles, we have 90 minute uh, sort of attentiveness cycles. And so they sort of used their, their, their brain and their attentiveness cycles. They, they, they did their most work early in the morning, but that they napped more, they had more leisure time, um, that it was very uh, intentional leisure. And what we've, what we've learned about leisure is that it requires two things, a sense of choice that you've chosen the activity, and control, that you've controlled the time. And so, you know, so really keep that in mind that that peaks and valleys, uh, kind of the pulse of being on and then time off, that that also mimics the sort of the, the, the stress cycle of having stress and release. Um, be really intentional with your time. Um, we tend to think of our schedules as like if we can cram everything in, that somehow that's how we're really amazing and, you know, uh, being busy. Um, but I spoke with a behavioral science researcher and he said, rather than think of your time and your schedule as this, this pamper you've got to cram everything into, think of it more as an art gallery. You know, that you're intentionally, you place things for a reason, uh, you know, in your calendar and make sure that there's white space around it. So be really protective and thoughtful about how you organize your time. And share the load, share the load at home. The story that I write about in my book is of, of a very, <laughs> A Thanksgiving that, that almost cost me my marriage where I was doing everything and at one point my husband came and went to the fridge and I thought that he was going to put the turkey in the oven and instead he took out a six pack of beer and he walked out the door to go like hang out with his friend all afternoon and I had a knife in my hand and I swear it's like if I had just had Cirque du Soleil training I might have just like tried to thwack it at him. Um, but, uh, you know, what we realized after that, uh, you know, it was, a, it, was, it was a terrible Thanksgiving. What we realized is that those ideal worker, ideal mother norms, or those, those movies started to play in our heads. And we had fallen into those gendered patterns without even meaning to. So we started again. It's like, okay, we've got clear on what our vision is. We want to share. We want to share work and home together. You know, my husband didn't even know where the pediatrician was or the kid's dentist. You know, and I, I, a lot of it was my guilt. I felt like I should do that if I was going to be a good mother. So I kind of kept it from him. So maternal gatekeeping. So how could we really share that load at home? How could we support each other at work? And we started with like, okay, what's the bucket of work that needs to get done? Who's good at it? Who wants to do what? How do we divide it fairly? And how do we keep each other accountable? So we started really small with the dishes. So I load the dishes in the morning or I, I empty the dishwasher. He's supposed to load it. And when he doesn't load it, this is me, this is my sink, I took this picture and I texted it to him and I just said, really? And then I did not do the dishes. I did not rescue him. 
Uh, when he came home from work, he had to do the dishes and that was sort of our understanding. We had to keep each other accountable because the research will show that women spend three to five hours uh, redoing chores that they feel that their partners have done badly. So part of it is I didn't do that. And, and finally, be part of bigger change. You know, when I mentioned that we don't, we don't have, we are, it's the United States and Papua New Guinea that do not have paid maternity leave. We do not have paid parental leave. We do not have paid family leave. Uh, we do not have paid sick days. We do, even after the pandemic, we do not invest in childcare. And a lot of that can be traced to the 1970s and this man, Pat Buchanan. In my book, I write the story about how his view, we've got very close to having universal childcare in the United States. And his view was that it was like the Soviet Union. He'd just come back from a trip to the Soviet Union and he thought, you know, childcare is like communism. And so he told me we wanted to kill the bill and the very idea of childcare in the United States. And he was effective because it is only now in the dumpster fire of the pandemic that we are beginning to talk about how childcare does not work in the United States. So be part of bigger change and recognize that it can be, it, the benefits can be huge for everyone. You know, for instance, when men take parental leave, if you look, this was a study in Iceland, um, you know, before this policy that encouraged men taking leave, women were still doing the majority of care, not only at the beginning of life, but three years later. Once it became the norm through policy and culture that men took paid family leave as well. If you look, three years after a child is born, the majority of families are equally sharing care, which means that they're equally sharing time at work, which means that there's more opportunity for all men and women to have work, love, and play. And the final thing that I'll leave you with is the Greeks thought of time in two ways. You know, sort of the chronos was the day-to-day, -day, the, the, you know, the time of the clock. And the other was this, this notion, notion of kairos, this sort of like ever-present moment. You know, and so when we think about, you know, yes, there are things that you can do individually as organizations, but, uh, you know, and, and larger change that we need. But kind of tapping into this moment, this, this notion that we only live in the present and fully embracing that, that's one of the first things that you can do to have that sense of time serenity instead of time confetti. So let me stop my screen share at that. And it's, at this point, I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks to those who have um, asked some questions, both to everyone as well as uh, directed towards me. Um, and so I hope I wrote these down properly. So um, one question is about taking vacations. Uh, is, is there any data about taking vacations or not taking vacations and overall wellness or productivity? Yeah, there's some really great research about that and I'd be happy to share some links and some work that I've done as well. Um, but just to be very, you know, very brief, um, the uh, Framingham Heart Study looked at, um, you know, kind of obviously health over time. Uh, as and other studies have as well. And they found that uh, for men who did not consistently take vacation, uh, the risk of having a heart attack was increased by 30%. You know, for women, it was 50%. There are studies that show that women, um, uh, women in particular have more depressive symptoms if they don't take vacation. There's a really fascinating study out of uh, Sweden where, you know, the entire country takes the month of July off. And uh, what they found is that antidepressant use just it just falls off the cliff in July. And part of what they realized, they called it collective restoration. That when, you know, think about it, that it's very different when you go on vacation and everybody else is still working and there's sort of this worry and guilt. And in the United States, we, we also do not have a national paid vacation policy. About 25% of low wage workers primarily do not have any uh, access to paid time off at all. Um, most people, if you have vacation through your employer, you, you get about 10 days. Americans leave most of that on the table. They don't even take those 10 days. And many take work along with them. Uh, particularly, a lot of people answer emails. One of the reasons why is they're terrified of what's going to happen when they come back to work. This, this notion of like this exploding inbox is part of what keeps people working. So that our vacations aren't truly restful. You're not really getting away from work. Um, and so that's, that's what's so interesting is that, um, you know, that collective restoration, think about that time between say, you know, Christmas and New Year's when so many places closed down, there is that sense 
that, uh, you know, that it's, it's sort of a time out of time almost. So that's what the entire month of July is like in Sweden. And they found that people were had more time for each other. And when you look at sort of happiness research, you know, it's really clear that uh, our connections with other people are what lead to the most sense of, of human happiness. And so in that time when everybody is off, there's, there's more connection, there's more time together. Uh, in a positive way, I would say that there have been time together, you know, maybe with, without that sense of choice during the pandemic. But there is some really important research that shows the not only the health benefits, but some of the those sort of psychological benefits as well um, uh, from research, uh, from, from taking vacation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, someone else asked, can, um, what are your daily or weekly wellness practices and how does your family make time for joy slash play together and as individuals? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And, you know, I have to say my husband's a whole lot better about it than I am. I tend to have workaholic tendencies uh, that I'm very open about that I really struggle with. And uh, yes, I am a proud member of Workaholics Anonymous. <laughs> so, I mean, part of what I, why I, I suppose I can, I, 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 they say that you, you research and write the books that you most need. So there, I'm, I'm lucky in the sense that I have a partner who will come and say, hey, let's go hiking. Aren't you the one that said we need time for play? I'm like, ah, dang, you're right. Okay, okay. So some of it for me is, uh, you know, really getting clear on expectations. Um, I really struggle with that. And, you know, there's something called the planning fallacy that human beings think that we can do more and that it won't take as long. And so we just kind of, that's part of why we cram our schedules. Like, oh, I'm sure I can do this. And we really can. It takes a lot longer. And things take more time than, than we give ourselves uh, sort of bandwidth and time for. So part of what I try to do is recognize that, recognize that I really struggle with that. And then I create slack or kind of space in my calendar to try to do all the things that I thought I would get done, that I expected to get done, that I didn't get done. And one of the things then, you know, so I try to create that on Friday afternoons to kind of like that catch all slack time. Um, and, and then honestly, somebody once asked me, what is your, you know, your, your best time management advice? And honestly, it's compassion, compassion for yourself, because we live in a society that does not make this easy. You know, and Harvard Business Review read a, a piece where they'd, um, you know, surveyed all these executives and they all said work-life balance is a fallacy. It's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's impossible. So if we live in a, in, a, in a culture where most of our leaders don't think it's possible, how do we feel like we can actually make that happen? You know, so it's, it's difficult. Uh, so recognizing that, uh, you know, if you try to have work-life balance, you're going to be threatening to other people. And, you know, you'll, you'll kind of get blood shamed, you know, like, oh, wouldn't it be nice? Oh, I wish I could do that. You know, so we don't celebrate it here in a way that, that other cultures do, that have more of a, a commitment to leisure or leisure culture. So I guess that's the first thing is recognize that it's hard. Give yourself permission to do it. And when you don't or you fail, you fall down, forgive yourself, have compassion and begin again. I think that's probably the, the, the best, you know, that's what I practice because I fall over and over again. And I, I study this for a living, you know, and I, I wrote a piece once for New York Magazine about how even people who are experts who do this work-life balance, work-life research, you're terrible at work-life balance. So it's, it's recognizing that we live in a, in a culture that doesn't make it easy. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a good question to, uh, from Jenna Adams. Um, and she says, this is critically important in our, what you're talking about, this is critically important in our organization, especially now. Is there one idea for policy change you'd recommend to create the greatest impact? Yeah, well, a couple of things that I can think about, you know, when you look at like effective organizations uh, where they, they have made sort of well-being, uh, you know, as sort of a, a central part of their culture, you know, the first thing that they do, and you're seeing it now in the pandemic, you see it in the companies that have gone to say four day work weeks in like a company in New Zealand that sort of created this, set off this wave. The first thing they do is get really clear, sort of like the Johnny Carson priority list, you know, but get really clear at work. What is it that you're doing? What is your mission? What is your what is your what do you need to do? Uh, and get clear about that. What's the value that you bring? Uh, how are you going to organize? Uh, how are you going to communicate expectations? And get really clear about that. 
you know, so much of our work is what I would say is sort of, uh, I sometimes I call it the performance of work and work around the work. It's not the real work. You know, even in studies of burnout, um, you know, for physicians, uh, some of what they feel is that they don't have the time to do the work that's most meaningful. They're sort of caught up in, you know, bureaucratic keeper work and that that can be very frustrating. So I think systems need to recognize that. What is it that, you know, why did people get into this field or why are they in these organizations? Uh, and how can you organize, do that work hygiene so that, that it, they can spend the most time doing that work? You know, really rethink meetings. Do we really need all these meetings, whether we're in person or Zoom meetings? Um, emails, uh, you know, it was, uh, emails were designed to make our lives easier and they have made everybody's lives more miserable. You know, uh, how is it that, that this tool that's supposed to make life uh, work easier and more effective has really been a drain on people? You know, we did some research with Ideas42, this behavioral science firm, and we went to a number of different places and so many people felt overloaded and overworked. And then you talk to them about how their day went. And what they'd say is, I was busy all day. I just, you know, running from meeting to meeting, and, you know, plowing through all these emails. And then I get to five o'clock and the one big thing, that concentrated work thing I needed to do, I didn't even get it started. So then work, you know, it, it extends into the evenings and then it comes home with you and then it goes into the weekends and then you're never really refreshed and you're kind of resentful and you're kind of angry about it, you know, and you're kind of constantly in that tunnel and feeling behind. Um, you know, and, and when we ask people, you know, uh, so that sense that that meetings and emails, sort of the work around the work was eating away at them, um, you know, that's really clear in some of the research. Uh, Bain and Company did this uh, research on time spent. And what they found is that the average middle manager in the United States between meetings and emails and sort of like the interstitial 20 minute kind of nothing time between the meetings, they only spend six hours a week on that meaningful concentrated work. You know, so that's the first and probably most important thing you can do is really focus on work hygiene. How can you expand that six hours? How can you shrink the time? Or how can you make meetings more effective? And you know, can you break them up? Do you, can you make sure that there's an agenda? Does it have to be a meeting? Can it, can it be something that, uh, you know, goes over a Slack channel? How do you make decisions? How do you do your work? Uh, you know, I think that's probably the most important thing be really clear about that, um, you know, and then where do you need to do your work? You know, think about, you know, time, manner, and place of work. Uh, can it be flexible? How can you be responsive to people? Uh, what really needs to get done? You know, obviously in medicine, things have to be done where the patient is, you know, but, but how can, there's all sorts of uh, really fascinating um, innovation around telemedicine that we've learned through the pandemic, you know, um, pregnant doctors who've been able to work remotely and do high level work through telemedicine, how can we be creative and time matter in place uh, about how we do the work once we're really clear on what that work is? Thank you. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but um, someone was asking if you could comment upon the use of devices like the Pomodoro, Pomodoro timers. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, and is that counterproductive to have these high intensity times with breaks or is that just uh, more of the same culture? So, yeah, you know, so there are all sorts of time management and tools and techniques that you can use. And I would say two things about that. There can be very helpful. And I've, I've used the Pomodoro method. That's sort of basically where you come up with, you, you put your to-do list, you write everything down and then you set a timer for 10 minutes. And then you just start going down your list and, and or, you know, 20 minutes or whatever you're going to, whatever number uh, of whatever time you're going to take. And you just go down your list. When the timer goes off, you take a break and you totally change the channel. You do something, you go for a walk, you have a cup of coffee, and then you come back, you set the timer again, and you just keep going down your list. That can be really effective if you need to power through things. I've also done personal Kanban, you know, where you are, you're only focusing on three things, but you kind of got your, your sort of waiting list. So, so you know what's coming. I've done David Allen and doing the brain dump and then choosing one thing to do, you know, kind of like the energy project. There's all sorts of great methods out there, but I think that the, you're getting to an important point is that if you just dive into all of that in this kind of busyness culture, you know, you can power through things and guess what? There's just gonna be more stuff that's gonna come on your to-do list. So I think, yes, use these techniques, 
but also combine that with this understanding of like what again what's important what's what's effective um and you know uh, to the earlier question of like how do you make time for joy and play and i i i, I meant to answer this and this is this is part of this question as well you need to schedule things you know schedule play you know put that in your art gallery you know schedule time that for joy schedule time for family put it in there with the same value that work has you know when it needs to be there you don't worry about slinking out to the you know the third grade recorder concert that's part of your life that's important you need to put a you know a marker around that so that you're not over scheduled for a meeting um, you know, that makes you feel like you can breathe because it kind of like your you're full, the, the integrity of your full authentic self is recognized. So schedule things, practice. Uh, the more you practice having time uh, like that, the, the better you get at it because you'll be, you'll, you'll be rested, you'll feel better, you'll, you'll be able to make the case. And if you need to make case to managers, come talk to me because I've got plenty of research that can, you know, that can help you make your case for why uh, you know, having well-being and having time will make you a more effective and more productive worker. So much of our time is just sort of butt in, butt in chair time, sort of burned out time, dragging, particularly in the pandemic, you know, forcing ourselves to go through the motions, making mistakes because we're tired, so that you can avoid so much of that if, you know, if you kind of flip things around in your head and really, get, again, focus on that work hygiene, scheduling time for you know, for play and for joy uh, and practicing it. Great, thank you. I'm, I'm mindful of the time in that in this culture, uh, everything is starting at the top of the hour. You mentioned uh, get a hold of me. So if someone wants to reach you, how can they do that? So uh, I can, I'm happy to send you my email. Uh, it's BridgetSchulte at gmail.com is my regular email. Um, uh, you can reach out to me uh, also Schulte at newamerica.org. That's my New America email address. Um, I'm on Twitter at Bridget Schulte. You know, um, you can send me a direct message or send me, a, uh, send me anything through there. Um, I'm happy to support you in this journey because this is something that we all as Americans need to, need to be thinking and working about. We're thinking about and working on. Yeah, thank you. Um, also, uh, we will, we've been recording this. We were going to host this on our private YouTube channel as well so that you can watch this uh, or perhaps show it to your, to your life partner as well. Bridget Schulte, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. We really appreciate it. Um, what you spoke on is critically important to us as individuals and to us as an organization, and we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful being here with you today. Bye-bye.